Is the executive branch also broken? Let's look at that here on American Issues Take Two. Uh, and we have our co-host, uh, Tim Apicella, our regular uh, con contributor, Stephanie Stoll Dalton, and a special esteemed guest, Colin Moore, of the political science world at UH Manoa. Welcome all, all to the show. Thanks, Jay. So uh, let, me, let me begin with you, Colin. Um, you went to school, you learned political science, you studied it, you read it, you took tests in it, you wrote dissertations in it. Um, how do you feel now? I mean, was it was it worthwhile? What's going on? The work politically, political science wise, uh, the country is devolving. Um, we may not have a country after a while. Uh, you you think you should have studied basket weaving instead? Absolutely not. I mean, the irony here was when I was in graduate school, people who studied U.S. politics like me were considered a little boring. The action you should be studying Latin America or Africa or somewhere interesting. So. You know, as horrible as it is to say, this as the United States has had more political problems, being a political scientist studying the institutions has become challenging and fascinating. And I don't think the the uh, the discipline has been able to keep up. And, and we were really wrong about a lot of things. I mean, when I was in graduate school, everyone basically believed that we, we had this figured out. I mean, the United States was an advanced, stable democracy. And sure, there were some problems around the edges, but... But more or less, the, you know, the system worked in a rational way that largely benefited most people, um, you know, and, and we just had to tinker around the edges. And that, that's clearly not true. And, and Donald Trump managed to, you know, to really blow up a system that we thought had reached kind of perfect equilibrium. Well, so it seems retrospectively. You know, Shakespeare said, first thing we do is kill all the lawyers. You know, maybe we have to... We, we have to rewrite that. First thing we do is kill all the political scientists. I, I hope you're not too concerned, Colin. <laughs> I hope. Well, yeah, I, I, I hope I'll be safe. Yes. <laughs> Maybe they'll go for the lawyers first. Yeah. <laughs> so, OK, we have we have a system where we're pretty sure um, that Congress is broken because the Senate is broken. And uh, so many things have happened that makes us wonder where, whether they are interested in or competent to manage business of the country, which is complex, 330 million people, a million issues, and, you know, in, in some ways, the most important country in the world, and somebody's got to manage it, and, and, and Congress has a lot of power under the Constitution. Um, Congress seems to be broken. Okay, then we go to the Supreme Court, and if we weren't sure before, uh, we now know that with a supermajority and, uh, you know, on the conservative side, actually, it's beyond conservative, it's something else. It's, it, it's irrationally conservative, if you will. Um, the Supreme Court is broken. So let me put the title question to you, Tim. Uh, is the executive broken? Because if the executive broken is broken, we're in some real kimchi. Well, each branch of government is interactive. I mean, one impacts the other. And uh, you just mentioned it, that the Senate is broken. Well, what effect does that have on the executive office? If you can't get through Congress, then you go to what Obama started to do as executive orders. And that only gets you so far. And then when your term is up, uh, your next president, in this case, it was Donald Trump, uh, came in with an avalanche of executive orders and only to be reversed when uh, President Biden comes in office. That's no way to run a government. So, you know, every branch has to do their their part. And, you know, a lack of bipartisanship cooperation in the Senate uh, is leading us to these problems, thanks to the polarization of, of politics and the inability to talk to one across the aisle and almost a, a vitriol uh, attitude towards one side to the other. That's got to stop somehow. And uh, Donald Trump certainly inflamed that and lit it on fire. And I think President Biden is trying to do his damnedest and his best to, uh, you know, reduce the temperature, but it's not happening because Trump's influence is still alive and well. Is the executive broken, Stephanie? I, uh, yeah, I would say it's a concern because, as you know, all of these agencies are like a cake. You know, there's the cake part, then there's the icing over it. And all the icing is the Schedule Cs and the SESs and the people that are actually moving the policy down through through the agency work, which the agency work itself is the the grunt work of getting the grants out, get the contracts done, doing the oversight, doing the regulation. So um, 
it it is at this point probably broken because that icing layer is is open. In other words, that's uh, where the president fills in with um, the the politicals, and they're still working to fill that up because that was really hollowed out, as you said earlier, um, and um, by by the last administration. So there are plenty of jobs, but um, they're. Um, yeah, so they're in the process of uh, bringing it back up to to a level of operation that's good. I mean, even the IRS is, you know, that that got has been also um, hollowed out. Now mm -hmm. I understand they're giving it more money and they're going to hire agents so that they can they could do more close oversight of the middle class. They're going to be looking there uh, to make sure they they do um, the auditing of those tax returns, which is a little surprising. You know, Colin, you said that, uh, you know, not too long ago, it was in balance somehow, and we could have confidence in it somehow. Uh, it was remarkably easy, at least to the observer, for Trump to mess up uh, the, the Congress with the help of, of McConnell. Uh, it was remarkably easy for Trump and McConnell to mess up the Supreme Court, and they sure did. Um, we, what we didn't realize, um, that he was also actively messing up the executive branch. He, he was uh, pulling the good people out, corrupting them, firing them, forcing them out, uh, and then replacing them with people who were not competent, but whose only criteria was uh, whether they were loyal to him. And we, we know more about that now. Every day we learn more about that. It's like a tu brute. After you do Congress and the Supreme Court, you also do the executive and we are finding out that, you know, this seemed to be so easy that a, a would-be autocrat like Trump actually had no difficulty in messing up all three branches. Uh, my, my question to you is, uh, um, you know, how hard is it to come back? I think it I think it's gonna be it's gonna be a challenge for for a few reasons. I think the first is that, and you mentioned that it this kind of came what was unexpected, how easy it was to mess these things up. And I think even close political observers realized when Trump was in power how how much of this is built on norms, just shared understandings of the way that government should work or what's appropriate and what's not appropriate more than beyond just the laws that enforce those. And so if you get people in there who are perfectly willing to violate all of the norms and push things to their absolute limit, like Trump was, uh, you know, even past what was legal, of course, although there was a little more pushback there, um, you, you can get surprisingly far. I mean, democracies are, are fragile. We've always known that. That's why it's so hard for emerging democracies to succeed. Um, but in an advanced democracy, I think we thought those norms were a little more robust. And I think everyone had that experience when Trump was in office that, oh, well, now he's done this. Now that's, you know, that's too far. People are going to, that's really beyond the pale. Uh, there's going to be consequences now. And, and there never really were. So he kind of blazed a path um, to do some of those things. I mean, for example, politicizing the executive branch. He's been criticized for that. First, he's hardly the only president who, you know, pushed the limits a little bit to try to use exec the executive branch to help his, his political agenda. But past presidents have always been careful about that. I mean, they've understood that there's a limit that they're not willing to go beyond, you know, with some important exceptions like Richard Nixon. Trump just blew past all of that. So lots of presidents have, have pushed this in the past. But, you know, to give an example um, in terms of uh, you know, I, want, I know one thing we wanted to talk about was, you know, how, how can you fix this? And one of the reasons it's going to be a challenge is because there were a lot of Trump political appointees, um, you know, who were mainly appointed not because of their competence, but because of their loyalty to Trump, whose positions were converted into civil service positions in the federal government. That's a practice called burrowing. And all administrations have done this to a, a limited extent, but I think it was taken to an extreme under Trump. And you know, the, the more sinister members of his administration also understood that you know, they needed to get their people in the Office of Personnel Management, which is supposed to police a lot of this, um, you know, to, to give the green light. So, you know, the folks who were supposed to watch for this um, were also uh, on board with a lot of what, what was going on. And, and those people are going to be very, very difficult uh, to root out. You know, it strikes me that the, um, the liberated ones, if you will, who have um, come before the select committee and talked about how life was in the Oval Office uh, around the time of the insurrection, mostly, because that's what the, the committee wants to know about. Um, 
they're Republicans and sometimes they're really right wing Republicans. And you would have to imagine, you know, looking at the Comey rule movie and reading his book, um, that they were sworn to loyalty at some point. I guess nobody would have gotten that far in his administration uh, who didn't swear to loyalty. So although now um, they're speaking out, good for them. The uh, fact is that while, while they were selected, while they were serving, um, they weren't what you would expect. Um, they, they were his, they belonged to him. And I guess the question I put to you is, uh, and this goes to our earlier conversation, um, this had to be happening in other agencies, other departments, other secretaries, other high level officials as well, who are not necessarily relevant to the insurrection, um, but who are nevertheless uh, also compromised. And uh, let me th throw a, a thought at you. I mean, the, the executive, which is comprised of all these agencies and departments and what have you, um, has probably got a lot of compromised people in it simply because he wasn't appointing anybody who didn't swear loyalty. Am I right? Do you want to take that, Stephanie? Well, sure. Um, you know, that that's true. Um, remember now with like agriculture, early on he he took all of the stellar research folk out, out of agriculture here in DC and sent them off to the hinterlands. I don't know, many of them retire, you know, quit. So um, he's removed a, a lot of the competence, which leaves then the, and those would have been civil servants rather than politicals because it, putting the politicals in couldn't have changed the the, re, the research act that you'd have to rehire. Anyway, I don't know that agriculture has pulled that back. I haven't read anything that they're full, full complement again to do the quality, high level quality work that they're noted for centuries of this kind of work. And then of course we have the example of the EPA which was also how people stopped dead in their tracks in the middle of article writing and publication and and uh, walking out the door. So um, these borough, these these uh, Schedule C folks, the politicals that come in or are appointed to these higher level uh, positions, they come in and they do what they do, but they they've got to move that entire huge workforce in an agency to come around to 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 do it their way. And there's a lot of pushback on that. And then mentioning those boroughs in, they don't always stay because those boroughs in, they're used to being on the Schedule C track up there in the icing on the cake not down in the cake where you've got to do the work okay and and you've got that you got to make uh you know make the standards and get get the the outcomes in place to meet the requirements of the statutes right because that's what these agencies are doing is they're implementing the statutory guide so so um they're on hopefully they're on their way back but it's a long way back to find the people that have the competence and want to be in the federal government well, uh, indeed, it's a long way back, and we've been uh, presumably on the way back for a year and a half, and we still have DeJoy running the post office. Right. I was right. thinking about that this morning, and I said to myself, gee, okay, he couldn't face him down. He couldn't yell at him. He couldn't tell him, you know, he doesn't want Sap Tours uh, coming election again. Um, but, you know, the board of directors of the Postal Service is made of appointees. And they could, you know, if, if even if you say that Joe Biden cannot fire DeJoy on a given Tuesday morning, um, the board can. And what, what amazes me is, is the board must also be compromised because they are not doing that. He's a known saboteur. Um, it matters now with the election coming and all the issues around voting and mail voting. Um, we still have him. What are your thoughts, Tim? Well... Yeah, I mean, I would, you know, if I was Joe Biden, which I'm not, but uh, you come in with a personnel sickle and you do that in the first month of your presidency, uh, partic particularly to those who are loyal acolytes of the former president. It's just what's done normally. A, a lot of times the presidents will come in and replace a whole gaggle of personnel uh, in different agencies. And let's not forget something, you know, um, behavioral organizations, um, uh, you know, they tend to, like the CEO of a company tends to hire people like themselves, similar philosophies, similar beliefs, similar type of personalities. And it over time, it filters all the way down to the person who drives the pickup truck. 
so when you have someone who's loyal to a particular individual, in this case, Donald Trump, uh, that's not a good thing because uh, to use um, Colin's term, burrowing, uh, that's why they transform the organization uh, to, to a particular persuasion of, of thinking. And I don't think Joe Biden did what he should have done, and that is just basically make changes. And if it was Donald Trump, I guarantee you, he would have done it in the first two months of anyone that he thought that was not completely on his side. Uh, I think Joe Biden in some ways is trying to act like President Lincoln and trying to have bipartisanship uh, of both sides of the aisle. And um, I hate to say that might be a little bit naive in his way of thinking, but I think that's exactly what it was. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I recall that there are some 4,000 appointments uh, on every change of power. I, I don't think that Joe Biden has made 4,000 changes. But the most delicious one of all, Colin, um, and really super delicious for our discussion, is the Secret Service, um, which has got to be an example of many lessons. What do you think about what happened and, and what is still happening? With the, Remember, James Murray is still in charge even now. Yeah, yeah, that... That, that was truly shocking when when uh, the January 6th commi committee revealed that, you know, they had somehow lost these text messages and, and largely were still working to protect President Trump. That's that's hard for me to explain, other than that, I think that there are certain agency cultures and uh, that even before Trump were more attracted to him and his form of politics. Um, I think the Secret Service is one. I think the Department of Homeland Security is one. You know, I think that there are people in those departments who were there before. I mean, civil servants or law enforcement agents who felt like Trump was their guy. He was speaking, you know, their language. And I think there was a, um, you know, they 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 naturally were, um, you know, inclined to provide him some cover. I mean, that's speculation on my part. Um, but I, I think that there probably is an element of truth to that. And I think the Secret Service um, was probably one of them. But I don't understand how he stays in charge unless, um, you know, especially after that disaster with the text messages, how those are lost. I, I can't imagine how you could explain that um, or, or provide a legal or legitimate explanation for that. Yeah, in fact, James Murray hasn't. Yeah, no, that's he, true. He, yeah, He hasn't said a word. He hasn't explained it. He hasn't apologized. He hasn't told us anything about it. And, you know, you leave it up to the Washington Post to find out what happened. And and you don't talk to them, you don't tell them, you, you shut down on them. Um, Jay, isn't that a comment on leadership from the executive? From James Murray? Yes. No, isn't, that, isn't this a <laughs> comment about our commander in chief allowing this, this travesty to occur and not stepping in to do something about it? I, I think it speaks volumes about his lack of leadership and uh, again, na na being so naive about the thing. Would you say, uh, Colin, to continue that, um, you know, that Trump has, A, left loyal sleeper cells through the executive branch. James Murray was and is one of them. Um, and he is not particularly loyal to the country or to Joe Biden. He is loyal even now because of his silence. He's loyal to Trump. And he's not the only one. I mean, there are people in Homeland Security who likewise lost records, and they're going through the same scenario and lack of excuse. Um, you can only, you know, it's not like the Fifth Amendment. They have a duty to get up there and tell us what happened, and they're not telling us what happened. So that speaks volumes. Would you agree with me? This, is, this sounds conspiratorical, but would you agree with me that there must be sleeper cells, uh, like Murray and uh, Chad Wolf is gone, but the people in Homeland Security who are still marching to Trump's orders right now? Uh, I think there are definitely some. I mean, the the, the people who are burrowed in, um, I, I, you know, I I I I believe that there 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 definitely are some who see it as their goal to undermine, in many cases, the agency that they're part of, um, or to push back in Homeland Security on more liberal immigration rules. Um, the thing, James Murray is an interesting character, though, because a lot of these people we're talking about um, who were appointed to these civil service positions were people who were basically wildly unqualified, who were political operatives who were stuck in there. Murray is not part of that group. He comes from a law enforcement background. Um, he, you know, is not, was not a political figure. You know, on paper, he seems qualified for the job he has. And that, 
that to me is actually a more interesting problem, which is I think that there, you know, he corrupted the cultures of some of these agencies and the Secret Service might be part of that. So there, there's kind of two ways I think you're seeing this. One from just political operatives who are embedded and, and agency cultures that were so, somewhat corrupted um, during this period. And the second, you know, the, the latter is much more difficult to stop and root out. I mean, as anyone who's worked in any organization knows, you know, changing an organizational culture is incredibly difficult. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, and, and, and a sleeper, that. a sleeper yeah. isn't necessarily somebody you can identify. You don't know if he's been right. compromised. You can't be sure. Mm -hmm. um, so, Stephanie, you know, what, what can Joe Biden do when he knows, at least logically, empirically, um, that there are sleepers in a given organization. We can we tolerate a secret service that we cannot trust? You know, there are all kinds of terrible things that could happen if the secret service is marching to Trump's orders. Um, what do we do? Very, very chilling. Um, I that these are bureaucracies, all right, including the secret service. So we are talking about serious bureaucracies for moving well, the around. The secret service gets like billions of dollars of budget every year billions yeah so there, there, are, are there are there's command and control in bureaucracies and there's no dearth of that in the executive branch for the for as i said the cake part of everything okay so um it's a matter again maybe tim's point the leadership it's command and control it's bureaucracy you take orders and you step to it um i don't know if there the, the question has come up um, I heard it on the media today, finally, that uh, there's some some question about why they can't find these messages, because this is the first time I've ever heard of anybody actually being able to erase something from the Internet or from email. I I, I mean, they're now going to get the special people in to take a look at th those those that equipment, because I thought you never could pull anything out permanently from you couldn't erase OK, so there's some incredulity here about how how lost are the, all of those messages. Are they that smart that they know how to do that? The Secret Service isn't an Internet organization or the Facebook. I mean, so anyway, I'm waiting to hear more about that. So I have some expectation that we're going to find out that, as we already know, you can't erase anything from the Internet. You can, they I'd, like can't, to, I'd like to add a, a personal think tech story on this. Um, we had an email this week from maybe one of our first video shows back in 2010. And he was from New Delhi. Um, and um, he, he asked our staff if they could give him the link to that show. Uh, and uh, he was an academician in New Delhi. And um, first we couldn't find it. And I said, oh, my goodness, you know, this, this sounds like a <laughs> secret service already. Can't find it. But then we looked closer and we found it. We found it. One of our first video shows, we were able to find it. So your point about looking on the internet is well taken. Usually there's a way. Even that's not the obvious way, there's always a way. But I wanna, I wanna shift gears with you, Tim, a little bit. You know, um, So uh, a, a political official from Hawaii went to, um, went to Washington shortly after Trump was in office and uh, and found that the, the halls of the State Department were empty, um, that the offices were empty, that a lot of people had been fired or left, um, and they simply were not unstaffed. And the State Department arguably uh, is, 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 is disabled, has been disabled, um, and um, is still disabled. Uh, and then I talked to uh, another friend of mine who is in Africa right now, and, and her comment to me today was that Russians are moving into Africa and in many places they own Africa and the United States is not there. Do we have a foreign policy? So the fact is all these distractions that we've been talking about, the domestic distractions, the distractions around our democracy and the division in the country uh, suck up a lot of time for any president. Um, but they certainly suck time away from foreign policy and foreign policy in the liberal world order is very important. Your thoughts about that? Well, I think Joe Biden did years of fence mending in short order with NATO and our European Union allies. Uh, what normally would have taken years to undo the damage that Trump did, uh, Joe Biden was magnificent in this effort. 
Uh, again, years of patching up in, in a matter of months. Uh, unfortunately, as a result of the invasion of Russia into Ukraine, a lot of that happened exponentially quick. Uh, you know, I, I go back to Donald Trump and his motivation for doing these things. Uh, a, a great part of it, of, as you know, is try to isolate the United States away from our allies. Uh, I go to the comment that he constantly made is only I can fix it. And thanks to his hubris and his ego, he meant it. Um, you know, Jay, on this Halloween out in the State Department, the State Department has two cores. They've got the Foreign Service people and they have the Civil Service people. So this Foreign Service group, are they the ones that are leaving? I mean, they... they um, I, so they also go international too. So the foreign for the State Department has a, a lot of different things in it from the other agencies, but because they have that foreign service group, they're pretty committed. So they usually stand up to whatever they have to endure until they get to sixty five when they have to they have to retire. I, I don't know the answer to your question, but let me let me go to uh, Colin. So Colin, you know, part of this is looking into the echo chamber, looking into the future. Um, what was uh, Charles Dickens, uh, the, the ghost of Christmas future? Um, you know, we we have our allies. Um, uh, we wish we had more. We have some quasi-allies and some people who clearly not our allies with respect to Ukraine. Um, but um, they watch like everyone in the world. You know, Think Tech has a lot of shows overseas. And we always ask them, you're watching American television? Are you seeing American movies? Are you reading American newspapers? Um, and are you following the action domestically? And the next question is, uh, what, what will happen if Joe Biden doesn't, isn't president anymore? What will happen if Donald Trump gets to be, or one of his acolytes gets to be president? And, and they express concern, because to the extent that the executive is weak now, it's likely to be mm, much more troublesome later. And they worry about the future. Is it, leg is it a legitimate worry? I think it's absolutely a legitimate worry. I mean, I think this, the chaos created by the Trump administration and our hyper-polarized politics has just done untold damage to the reputation of the United States and the world and the reputation of democracy. Um, you know, I was reading an article in the New York Times uh, a couple of days ago that, that was explaining how elites in Africa you know, no longer are looking to the United States, not just because China has provided more direct aid, but also because this mo this Chinese model of kind of meritocratic authoritarianism seems more workable to them. They look at, you know, the world's oldest mass democracy and it seems to be falling apart. And the Chinese seem to be doing all right, at least in terms of improving the li living standards of their people. You know, and this of course is used as propaganda and rhetoric against the United States. So, you know, I think it's it goes beyond just having a foreign policy. I think, you know, we're always under scrutiny because there is so much reporting of American politics and American culture. And I think that the conclusion for a lot of developing countries is that, you know, this is not the, you know, train they want to hitch their wagon to anymore. Um, you know, the Chinese might look like a more plausible ally, even if you know, they, you know, rightfully are skeptical of their human rights record and, you know, see them as a little more opportunistic, they also have had some uh, very obvious successes. Um, and so I understand that that position. Um, so our own failures here domestically are have done just tremendous damage to our reputation abroad. Um, so Tim, you know, I'm fascinated with that movie, The Comey Rule. I'm fascinated with with the book that drove that movie. And there's one part of that movie that I think is worth talking about here at the end of our discussion. And that's the part where, where Trump uh, places a call to Comey and he said, let's have dinner. And uh, this is the center of the movie and I'm sure it's the center of the book. And I, and I saw a, an interview of Comey and it was the center of that interview, this one event. And he says, uh, come over to the White House and let's have dinner together. And Comey is amazed that the dinner is at a little tiny little table, just the two of them. And Trump uses that dinner um, without any hesitation to ask, to, he said, you want to remain director of the FBI, which was strange because uh, Trump was complimenting him in public. Uh, and then he said, um, 
Are you loyal? Can you be, will you be loyal to me? I need your loyalty. And it was a, you know, face on attempt uh, to corrupt the man. And, and I, and somehow, as Colin said, you know, we're in a, in a new time here, um, that this could happen under Trump and query could it happen under, you know, President DeSantis going forward or any president who wants to corrupt the system to demand loyalty over duty, over country. And my question, which isn't easy for you, is how do we stop that? There are rules, they were, but they were not followed. And um, you know, we 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 don't think that uh, Comey was corrupted as much as Trump wanted to corrupt him, but to some extent he was corrupted, and many others. How do we stop that small table corruption conversation in the White House? Oh, I, I think Liz Cheney's done an excellent job to answer that question, and that is to remind all agency heads, all those who participate in government and the military is that you have an oath to the country, to the constitution, to the rule of law, not to any one individual. And I think that needs to be pounded into the front part of someone's cerebral uh, temperance to, to, to remind themselves of that and be willing to lose your career to reinforce it. And I think that's our problem is that we have um, career politicians, career agency heads that are making a lot of money. They're doing very well for themselves. They're, you know, they have a, a lifestyle that's probably pretty considered pretty good. And uh, the, the risk of losing that lifestyle versus standing up to your oath of office and your, your ethics and your morals um, doesn't always win the day. You want to, you know, that's half of our politicians in Congress, they know darn well the problems that Trump brought on and the lies that they have to live with because they want to be reelected and they need that paycheck. So um, it's the it's a it's a humanistic thing for us to have to to do to focus on that is um, your personal ethic and your mission to the agencies or to the country. You know, I've, I've been meaning to ask you this question um, through the show, Colin. And that is, in the study of political science, in the study of American political science, you have to have a social compact. You have to have everyone in the country believes fundamentally in the country and in the system. And it strikes me that we are getting evidence every day that people do not believe in the country. They do not believe in the system. Uh, is this rep repairable? Um, or are we going to have to you know, find another system? Um, maybe something like what Xi Jinping has. Um, can, can we re-knit re the tattered sleeve uh, of our social compact? I think that is the central question, Jay. Um, we, we tried it. We tried it one other time um, after the Civil War, and I'm not sure that even that was entirely successful. Um, if if it happens, I mean, it may happen as a result of generational change. I mean, that that's where I see some hope um, that people, younger people, may be less stuck in these um, very polarized views about, about the country. They're certainly more open to a more diverse country in, in all sorts of ways. Um, but they also you know, may continue to be skeptical of our government, of, uh, of the system. Um, you know, I think that, that idea of a shared understanding of the system has sometimes been a bit exaggerated. I think that existed in a remarkable way post-World War II. Um, mm -hmm. I think it was a little more fragile. So I think a lot of us grew up during a time when not only was the United States very prosperous, there really was this shared understanding of the way things should work. Um, you know, I, I think it's going to be a challenge to get back to that. And I think one thing that would help is for the government to really start delivering for people. Um, you know, that means more than just legislation. That means seeing a material difference in your own life. And even the Democrats haven't been great about, about delivering that. I think if inequality keeps increasing and young people can't afford to buy houses and so on and so forth, then you know, why, why would you trust a system that's not delivering for you? Yeah, what about, what about, what about a president, though? What about the chief executive who comes and says, look, this is the reality. I, I recognize the challenges. You have to work with me. Why am I reminded of JFK's uh, inauguration speech? Think not of what I can do for you. Think of what you can do for me. Another president, a president with that kind of strong heart rhetoric who can speak to the souls of the people 
like a fireside chat with FDR, like a JFK, like Jimmy Stewart. He wasn't president, but you know what I mean. <laughs> right. <laughs> a, a new executive, an executive who meets those specifications, who can touch you, even in times of adversity, wouldn't that help? I think it would help, but I, I mean, we haven't had a, a better orator in our times than President Obama, and he confronted a lot of the same challenges. I mean, you, you have to be able to deliver results. And if you are dealing with a polarized Congress, and like we have been talking about in the show, an executive branch full of officials that are trying to undermine what you're trying to do, then no amount of you know rhetoric only goes so far. Um, and I think, I mean, for example, FTR delivery. Yes, he had those fireside chats, but people saw their lives improve in dramatic ways during the New Deal. Um, and that's, I think, what really cemented the loyalty. That's why, you know, my grandparents would talk about FDR, because they really, you know, grew up in grinding poverty and saw themselves, their own lives, you know, change for the better. And I think that at the, at the end of the day, you do have to deliver those material benefits. It can't just be rhetoric. Mm -hmm. Okay, we're, we're into our final leg here. Um, uh, uh, final thoughts and summarizations and uh, takeaways. Uh, why don't you start, Stephanie? Well, I think uh, the, the comments about Liz Cheney from Tim and Collins' uh, point about delivering is so, so interesting and, and so obviously probably very true. But it also uh, reminds us that these people like FDR and others, uh, other other real leader leader presidents, pro, uh, produ productive presidents, they made the system work. They made the government work, and uh, it has occurred to me that our government is very complicated to get it to, and very hard to make it work. And what's so inspiring for me is that. So is this country we have, this diverse, huge country that for some reason the founders thought could become this magic country on a hill or city on a hill, and they devised this complicated government to make it work. But it turns out that all the things that the leaders have to do to make the government work are the kinds of things that the whole nation, all of the people have to learn to do. The, the, comp, the compromise, the negotiation, the working together, and all of this that our government requires of, uh, demo of people in a democracy. So I finally maybe come to my own satisfaction as to why we're not, like, why didn't they just make it like England and we'll do the parliamentary thing? Instead, no, we've got this crazy thing that doesn't, that doesn't uh, you know, sit there in any parallel manner and in any predictable way. But no, we've got something that is probably the only way for this huge, beautiful country that we're in can can be governed by. But we have to learn better how to use it and how to be part of it and how to make it productive for everybody. Yeah. Oh, and Tim, your your final thoughts and query, do we need a new constitution? Um, because we have so many threats and challenges and, and people who don't wish us well, who would like to bring us down. Um, how drastic should our steps be? Well, not a new constitution, but certainly some amendments. Um, I have to agree with Colin Moore completely. And that is whenever government, a term after term after term after term uh, through presidents, and there's nothing getting done. I remember John McCain at the Senate floor, nothing's getting done. And so when you have perpetual gridlock, it's an argument for your detractors and for would-be autocrats to say, see, democracy doesn't work. It doesn't improve your life. And, and Collins did spot on on that point. Now, I think my last point is, when you see an evaporation of the middle class, you have economic disparity between the classes of people, there comes dissension. And there, democracy doesn't look so great. Uh, so you look for a strong man that could take my life and make it look better, make it feel better. Whether it does or doesn't isn't the point. Um, so we've got to preserve the middle class economically, and we have to be able to break the gridlock in the Senate. Okay, Colin, um, you're the anchor man. Um, give us uh, your final thoughts, your summary, what you would like our audience to take away. And you could also include what I can do, what I can individually do to help. Sure. Well, I agree with 
uh, what Tim and Stephanie said. And I'd also add that for the president, I think it wouldn't hurt him to be a little more aggressive. I'm, we were talking about FDR, and I'm reminded by a, of a famous line from FDR who says, uh, they're unanimous in their hate for me. We're talking about bankers in this case, and I welcome their hatred. Um, and I think we could see a little more robust anger coming from the president, the sort of thing you've seen from Governor Gavin Newsom of California um, to really take this on because he by nature, I think his career as a senator makes uh, makes him someone who always looks for a compromise. And I'm not sure if we're going to be able to achieve one uh, now. What 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 can people do? Um, you know, I think it's to to have more conversations with more people about politics and government. I think that, you know, many people in this country have an idea that what they think is what everyone else thinks. Um, you know, that's just common sense. But by common sense, they mean that's that's what I believe or people I know believe. And I think more people need to be shaken a little bit from that to understand that there are reasonable people who who differ. And, you know, we only will have a democracy if we're comfortable having these disagreements, talking about them in, in civil ways. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you, Colin Moore, our special guest. And thank you, Tim Apicella, our host, co-host. Uh, and Stephanie Staldolz and our regular contributor here on American Issues Take Two. Thank you all uh, and aloha and um, gee, may God bless. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.